So I've noticed there are many people who talk about critical race theory without knowing much about critical race theory. And I'm not one of those people because I read this book. As you can see, it's quite well thumbed. This is Critical Race Theory, the key writings that form the movement. It's put together, edited by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, put together by her. And it's, I think, 37 different essays that are the genesis, uh, the formation, and the teleology of critical race theory as understood by Kimberly Crenshaw. Now, Kimberly Crenshaw is important because she's got several essays in here, and she's the woman who coined the term intersectionality. Uh, this is a university-level textbook, which is why I got it and read it, and I've made 100 pages of notes of it, and we're going to go through it together and understand what the hell they're trying to do. Now, it won't be as boring as it sounds, I promise, because there's actually a bunch of interesting ideas in here. But what the important thing that we have to do is, is understand what they're trying to achieve. And so, I'll be... Uh, quoting from my notes at length, unfortunately, so get ready for that. But um, but the, the, the point about this is that it's a left-wing critique of the liberal civil rights movement, or at least that's where it begins, because they're not happy with it. They're not happy with it because essentially it's going to end in, and I quote, black genocide. Uh, we'll get to those essays in due time. So in her overview, Crenshaw ten tells us that these essays are, quote, organized by a collection of neo-Marxist intellectuals, former New Left activists, ex-counterculturalists, and other varieties of oppositionalists in law schools. This means that critical race theory embraces a movement of left scholars, most of them scholars of color, situated in law schools whose work challenges the ways in which race and racial power are constructed and represented in American legal culture and more generally in American society as a whole. So that is, that's an important distinction to make, because while this is based in American legal academia, it is not merely a legal text. It is, in fact, a philosophical text. They are using examples of American legal precedents in order to extrapolate wider philosophical points. And that's important because a lot of people will turn around and say to you, yeah, but this is just some obscure legal doctrine. No, it's not. That's not true. And those people who say that haven't read it. Anyway, they say critical race theory is unified by two common interests. The first is to understand how a regime of white supremacy and its subordination of people of color have been created and maintained in America, in particular to examine the relationship between that social structure and professed ideals such as the rule of law and equal protection. And that is a great example of what I just mentioned. As you can see, they, are, they, cl they claim that there is a regime of white supremacy that subordinates people of color. This is a philosophical contention, and one I don't agree with, but it's not because it's not purely based in law. It is in all stratas of American society. The second desire is uh, the second point is a desire not to merely understand the vexed bond between law and racial power, but to change it. Because the whole point of any critical theory is to deconstruct and replace ultimately that thing that has been attacked by the critique. Because the critique is specifically designed to change the thing. It is not. It is not merely uh, observation, neutral observations about something that you have you have found. Like you can you can make a neutral observation of a piece of media. You're not going to be able to change that media. But here is some critique. This is something you can learn from it. But no. That's not the point of any critical theory. Anyway, the origins of critical race theory are in something called critical legal studies. Uh, this was basically communists who were not, not happy with the liberal approach to civil rights that was uh, enacted during America. And the reason that the critical race theorists came out of the critical legal studies is because most of the people doing critical legal studies were white. And the critical race theorists were like, well, you're not black, and therefore we don't need your opinion. Uh, what they did is carved out in the academy a kind of section for themselves uh, to be able to work to undermine the liberal consensus within the United States. And th this happened in the 70s, going through the 80s and into the 90s, where Kimberly Crenshaw started to write her famous essays that talked about uh, insectionality, um, demarginalizing the intersections and mapping the margins, I'm thinking of in particular here. And since then, it's been gestating and growing and radicalizing students in Marcuse's fashion uh, in order to create this kind of radical communist vanguard of an, an intelligentsia that rejects the current liberal order of the United States. And this is what you can see in the radical left-wing movement within the Democratic Party now. So anyway, this split in seven parts, and we're going to look at part one. 
Intellectual Precursors, Early Criticism of Conventional Civil Rights Discourse. This begins in Essay 1 with Derek Bell's famous, if you're in the right circles, Serving Two Masters, Integration Ideals and Client Interests in School Desegregation Litigation. The opening shot of critical race theory is against desegregation. Bell is a critic of the liberal crusade that was school integration, that is busing children from one school to another and forcing schools to be of mixed race, uh, because after the abolition of the separate but equal doctrine from Plessy versus Ferguson, integration was to be done across schools and wider society uh, with, quote, all deliberate speed, as in this was to be done intentionally as quickly as it made sense to do it without ruining everything that they had. And Bell instead thought that this was uh, honestly negative to black people and instead wanted better quality segregated black schools, which would presumably be funded by whites. He complains that the, the uh, fundamental crux of the issue on this, and it is a presupposition that is embedded within uh, integrationism, uh, from his point of view, is that the presence of white children is said to be essential to the black children receiving an education of equal quality, as in black schools won't be the equivalent of white schools if white children aren't in those schools, and he doesn't like this assumption. Uh, he feels that court-mandated segregation could be disadvantageous to black children, uh, however, given the current uh, uh, undercurrents of thought at the time, not even the undercurrents, the, the main thought at the time, uh, again, in the 70s, uh, he and in the 60s as well, uh, he felt that uh, this was just not something that was going to be overturned anytime soon, and of course it wasn't, uh, but he wanted to get away from this kind of way of thinking. Uh, but the civil rights lawyers and the politicians were committed to integration and policies like busing and redistributing blacks from black schools and these were pursued instead of supporting black schools. I don't agree with the idea that integration is bad and that we shouldn't pursue it. I'm an integrationist, I suppose. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an old style liberal, so I, you know, I am an integrationist. Uh, so I personally came at Derek Bell's perspective with a bit of shock, to be honest, when I first started reading it. But after having read so much of this, I'm kind of inured to the... Uh, radical perspectives that they have. Essay 2 is also Derek Bell. It's called Brown versus Board of Education and the Interest Convergence Dilemma. And he's written this uh, after a period of time after his first essay. And by this point, Bell feels that school desegregation has failed and needs to explain why. So legally, it was seen that segregation harms blacks and benefits whites. Uh, and Bell interprets this as meaning that true equality for blacks will require the surrender of racism-granted privileges for whites. And he says, naturally, white people are reluctant to give up their social status and have that reduced, leading to what Bell considers to be a lack of interest convergence between the civil rights integration lobby and the white community. He says, quote, the interest in blacks in achieving uh, racial equality will only be accommodated when it converges with the interests of whites, as in, the white people are not going to give up what he views as to be a kind of racial privilege, and therefore blacks will be systemically disadvantaged by this. He views the decision in Brown, uh, he, he views that it can't be understood without the verdict's value to white people concerned about the immorality of segregation and how in the South this was viewed as a barrier to industrialization. Uh, he thinks that this places white elites at odds with poor whites, who saw desegregation as a reduction in the quality of local education for their own children. Bell views this as poor whites preserving superior schools at the expense of blacks. And this is what represents the divergence of interests in, in white, of whites and blacks. His preferred solution, as he said in the previous essay, uh, was to desegregate schools and improve the what, what were known at the time as model black schools. And so essentially make all of the schools that the blacks had access to uh, black only, but model schools. Uh, and he notes that there are lots of forces that are opposed to this, such as teachers unions and other vested interests. And he doesn't seem to be particularly concerned about the moral problem of the separate but equal doctrine. He seems to be an adherent to it. 
So moving on to Essay 3 by Alan David Freeman, Legitimizing Racial Discrimination Through Anti-Discrimination Law, A Critical Review of Supreme Court Doctrine. Now, Critical Race Theory, this textbook anyway, that Kimberly Crenshaw has given us, uh, is underpinned by a series of philosophical theories, that is, interpretations of circumstances and actions and events that are interpreted in a particular way. Now, this particular way is not the only way of interpreting these things, and it is from a particularly left-wing neo-Marxist framing. And so if you are not a neo-Marxist, you may find yourself disagreeing with these things. And this particular essay by Alan Freeman is the first example of that. So Freeman introduces in this essay the concepts of the perpetrator perspective and the victim perspective. Note the framing there. He's coining these terms. So he's the one pulling these terms out of thin air and say, well, look, I'm using this term to describe a particular thing, and this is the thing, this is the content into which I'm imbuing this, uh, this term. And so if you call it the perpetrator perspective, that has an in inherently negative framing because nobody wants to be a perpetrator of something because it implies a perpetrator of a crime. Uh, the other framing, of course, denotes disempowerment, the victim perspective. No one wants to be a victim. And so you've got these two particularly negative frameworks, but they don't describe actually uh, inherently negative things, or at least uh, permanently negative things. So he says, the perpetrator perspective sees racial discrimination not as conditions, but actions inflicted on a victim by a perpetrator. Uh, so you can see why he's called it the perpetrator perspective, but you could have called this something else, such as, uh, I don't know, the act perspective, for example. You could have called it anything else. Uh, but this means that the perpetrator perspective is liberal and individualistic. Uh, the people within this perspective are concerned with fault and causation, uh, as in someone did something, and those that did not do that thing need feel no guilt. Uh, this is, of course, not a negative thing, unless you're a Marxist and you see everything in terms of class and systems in which you can't separate the individual from their own class. The victim perspective is the view that racial discrimination describes, quote, those conditions of actual social existence of a, as a member of a perpetual underclass. Now, again, the term underclass is a bit loaded, uh, but really what he means is a minority, a member of a, pe 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 bleh, a, member of a perpetual minority. But this does not necessitate disempowerment as the current crop of black billionaires and multimillionaires shows us, uh, or Jewish success in non-Jewish countries, or minority success anywhere, really. There are lots of countries where we can point to where minorities, ethnic minorities, have done very, very well, and this is not at the expense of the native population. Uh, but it is, of course, framed this way in order to justify radical change. This is a critical theory after all. From the victim perspective, the problem of racial discrimination will not be solved until the conditions associated with it have been eliminated. This is sort of like the origin point of the systemic view of critical race theory. Uh, and this is what constitutes Freeman's attack on the colorblind American law as, quote, the causation requirement serves to distinguish those conditions that the law will address from the totality of conditions that a victim perceives to be associated with discrimination. So the law won't do something for people who are not suffering a direct and nameable injustice. If you are poor, then it is not the law's job to make you rich. That's your job. He continues, These dual requirements place on the victim, again, we've assumed they are victims. Again. This all presupposed, all of this negative language, it's deliberately designed in order to invalidate the current paradigm. Uh, but anyway, these dual requirements place on the victim the nearly impossible burden of isolating the particular conditions of discrimination produced by and mechanically linked to the behaviour of an identified blameworthy perpetrator. As in, if you're not actually being oppressed by someone, you can't name your oppressor, are you being oppressed, and is it your fault? The point of critical race theory is say, no, it's not your fault. It is someone else's fault that you are poor. Uh, it's someone else's fault that you are in the particular life situation that you're in. But is it? Most of the time, when someone is oppressing someone else, it's very easy to name your oppressor. If you find yourself in a community that is uh, impoverished or uh, has high crime rates, whatever that is, 
Is that the fault of someone outside, perhaps the fact that the laws exist at all? Or is it the fault of the moral character of the people within that community? Again, depending on your political framework and your, your moral, moral view of the world, you come to a different conclusion on this than the Marxists. Uh, he puts simply though, he says that each act is part of a web of intent to keep the black community as an underclass. Again, this doesn't explain black success. Uh, however, he can't name the perpetrator other than by saying the system, which is essentially the same way of saying God. Uh, again, those blacks who are not trapped in the ghetto, ghetto must be rationalized away, such as Derek Bell. How did Derek Bell get into the academy in the 70s if the system is designed to hold down blacks? But more importantly, and this is, this is where it gets a bit mystical, frankly, it imbues the system itself with a kind of evil will that can't really be named, can't really be properly described, but is, in this view, definitely there. There's something evil about this. It's designed to hurt us. But is it? And I don't personally think that it is. And so Freeman asserts that a pure form of colorblind theory would outlaw any use of racial classification, but this is not the case in the United States, which has many racial classifications and precedents in law. And that's true. But again, notice what's happening here. He has abstracted the idea of uh, colorblind law from the context of the United States. And what he's then done is saying, well, look, this utopian view, or not even utopian, but this an abstract view of what could be, uh, I'm going to then judge against the United States of what is back in the 70s and say, well, you don't measure up to this. Well, of course not. You know, you, you're currently going through the civil rights process. Of course you don't have that. And uh, he says, as he says, the very nature of desegregation law demands racial understanding uh, or else black children have no affirmative right to a quality education comparable to white children. And so this leads him to believe that colorblind theory is a utopian vision that cannot be achieved. But is that the case? The very nature of the black community in America is a product of racial oppression, and this, in his view, can't lead to a colorblind community. Is this utopian, though? Because it seems to be from a liberal perspective, like a, not a radical revolutionary perspective, but an um, incrementalist perspective, that there's an inevitable march of progress towards laws which do not have a racial component, which in fact, California, they recently had a proposition to repeal the civil rights laws uh, that would prevent overt racial discrimination, as in, you know, you can't say white people this, black people that, etc., etc., uh, because they appear to have arrived at the position that Freeman is calling utopian, where they are not implementing new laws. But of course, if you're coming out of a race-conscious and racially oppressive society, you are going to have to be able to say, well, you're not allowed to do something based on race, or you, you won't be able to hold people back based on race. Uh, and so this feels like a very unfair critique, uh, one that is appealing to the United States having a history that it didn't have in order to create a future that the liberal civil rights advocates would like to achieve. He, uh, he brings up Title VII of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which he feels is the closest that the court has ever come to adopting the victim perspective, because, of course, everything up until this point has been the perpetrator perspective, quote-unquote, uh, as in the racial discrimination is an active act where you can name the perpetrator who is racially discriminated against the person who is the victim of discrimination. Uh, that's the opposite of the way that the Marxists want to look at this. Uh, for the further cases solidify the verdict. Uh, either make meritocracy work on its own terms or make up for the flaws with affirmative efforts. As in, it's acknowledged that in the 1960s and before, racial discrimination was legalized and this will have negative consequences for the black community. And so it follows from that that there can be some kind of affirmative action for black people uh, for a period of time. That does follow. Um, but the thing, the problem that he has with this is that this does not solve the problem because it leaves white people free to act as they want. He says, quote, If whites can find a way to leave the inner city, they may legally insulate their finances and schools from the demands of blacks for racial equality. Local autonomy is a code word for a principle of vested rights. As in the, and this is, this is encapsulated in the all deliberate speed uh, doctrine. Um, Yes, black people should be uh, have any 
barriers that they were placed upon them lifted. And there is definitely an argument that there can be financial or other aid given specifically to blacks because of this historical injustice. But that doesn't mean that all white people are a responsible for slavery or Jim Crow or anything like that. And that doesn't mean that people who have gained what they have through no direct oppression of black people should have themselves stripped of their property or stripped of their money. That would be an injustice in and of itself. And so the liberal solution to this was to try and prevent these injustices while solving a previous injustice. Either way, Freeman felt that this puts blacks in a worse position than under the separate but equal doctrine. Uh, if the system itself is the thing that is at fault, it would be better that blacks were segregated and provided for by the system than be left to integrate themselves into wider American society where white people can flee away from the black people. Anyway, essay four is The Imperial Scholar, Reflections on a Review of Civil Rights Literature by Richard Delgado. Now, this is where the civil rights literature... Um, becomes racialized. Delgado is analyzing the civil rights literature of his time and thinks he has discovered something. White scholars' systematic occupation of and exclusion of minority scholars from the central areas of civil rights scholarship. So he's not pleased that scholars from group A are writing about scholars from group B. Uh, and he also says that it defends white interests by attempting to play fair now without discriminating against white people. Now, that seems to be a natural logical consequence of us saying, well, racial discrimination is bad. As in, that was the liberal civil rights argument against discrimination against black people. If racial discrimination is bad, then racial discrimination against anyone is bad. So black people, it's wrong. Against white people, it is also wrong. Uh, and so this, he thought, put uh, pits the non-whites against each other and poor whites for affirmative action while protecting upper-class white prerogatives. Uh, he thinks that we should devise admission standards that result in proportionate numbers of each group. Uh, again, if you have a systemic Marxian view of what the world is, then of course you think that you have complete control over all of those systems. You do not recognize them as being the product of agency and free choice. Now, don't get me wrong, in the pre-civil rights era, they weren't strictly the product of agency and free choice because, of course, racially, black people were being inhibited from having these options. But that doesn't mean that the solution is to remove the concept of agency and free choice and, of course, varying outcomes uh, from white people after we alleviate the burden that's been uh, the, the restrictions that are placed on black people. Um, Delgado thinks that it is at the level of unconscious action and choice that the explanation is found, and the the need to make sure legal change is controlled and steady. And that's true. That's absolutely true. That's what I've just described. It is the product of people acting as individuals and as small groups and families and communities uh, that has created society as we know it. And this is unacceptable from the Marxist point of view. This is the thing that's preventing radical change. Uh, also, he thinks that many civil rights activists and scholars derive a sense of personal satisfaction from being at the forefront of a powerful social movement. Undoubtedly true. Go on Twitter and you'll see lots of civil rights scholars uh, who love and feel powerful uh, being at the forefront of a, a social movement. And so... What's Delgado's solution to this problem? This problem of white leftist scholars running around bossing everyone based on liberal views of civil rights advocacy. Well, he says the white scholars should basically just resign and let minority scholars take over. He says, quote, While no one could object if sensitive white scholars contribute occasional articles and useful proposals, must these scholars make a career of it? The day of the minstrel show is indeed over. And I concur. And then I would take that a step further. Must scholars of colour make a career of it as well? Why do we Why do we have to have a career like a career class of act, communist activists who are weaponizing civil rights legislation because they want to be desegregated because they don't like white people? Is that necessary? Does that need to be funded? Is that somewhere where we need to go? 
But anyway, that's the end of section one of Critical Race Theory, the key writings that form the movement. Uh, in the next section, we describe the critical legal studies and critical race theory split into what becomes critical race theory proper, and then from then on goes into the future and ends up at the position we're at now, where we've got all of these problems.